And I'm going to talk more to you about on the ground issues that I've been involved with when I was a regional ecologist. Um, there you deal directly with park managers on the ground. And I've recently moved to Kruger um, and I had to learn a bit more about the Kruger issues because I was more in the arid box. But um, I want to just, just show you how we as an organization work and then some of the issues we have. So I'm going to look at our biodiversity monitoring approaches um, in a changing world. Okay, so just to show you a bit um, where Kruger is, the one also showed you, Kruger is on the western boundary of southern, uh, on the eastern boundary of southern Africa, um, and South African national parks, or in short, sand parks, manage 21 different parks across the country. So all these green parks are um, some of our national parks. Um, and we divide our parks into four clusters. We've got the northern cluster, um, the more arid cluster, and that's also your cluster with your more sensitive environments. We've got our frontier cluster, and then also the coastal cluster. Now, in South African National Parks, we have different scientific services offices. The biggest office is here in Kruger. Um, we've got a smaller office here in the central of Kimberley. There's an office down here at Port Elizabeth. Um, also an office here in Neisner. And then in Cape Town, we've got another office. So we've got scientists based all over the country, and we need to work together to do monitoring across all the parks. So what I'm going to, show, to, to tell you about is, um, as a big organization, we develop a biodiversity monitoring framework, which consists out of different programs. And I'm just only going to focus on the one on global climate change. Um, we've got four main aim, aims. Um, the first one is to support ongoing regular daily monitoring of weather in our national parks. The second aim is to strategically expand monitoring of climate, including microclimate, where we feel it's more necessary. Thirdly, um, ensure the collation and analysis and archiving of our climate and my meta metadata so that when we need it, it's all together at one spot. And then, um, lastly, is to identify and prioritize and design projects to monitor the impacts and consequences of climate change. Now, since we are not a lot of scientists, we, need, we can't do monitoring in all our parks. So we need to develop and prioritize where we, we, we can um, put all our effort to, um, to the parks that's got the most priority, the highest priority. Those are the parks, the projects that we can get involved with. So in, um, to summarize this, our um, climate change monitoring program consisting out of the routine monitoring from weather stations inside our parks, but then also in close vicinity around the box. And then secondly is to then design these specific projects where the highest priority is needed. Now, to zoom back into only Kruger, um, Kruger is about 2 million hectares in size, and it was established in 1898, um, and then officially proclaimed in 1926. Um, this is the park where research actually started. So this is the park where we have the most data um, on research. We've got really good um, species list of all the animals, um, plants, um, geology, um, weather data. Um, so Kruger is really our flagship park, and it's the park that also attracts the most overnight visitors. Um, therefore, it's also the park that's most important for income generation because Kruger sustain a lot of our other parks. Now, just to give you a bit of, to show you Kruger, it's this bit here, um, on the boundary with um, Mozambique. So we are also part of this Transfrontier Conservation Areas. Um, so we've got Mozambique as well, um, got Bona Reserve up here, and Zimbabwe. So Kruger is a big park, um, with over across boundaries. So we've got actually a good ecosystem that is um, quite intact and um, doesn't need a lot of management, on-hand management. But um, as Duane has also showed you this slide, on our um, western boundary, we've got all these very um, impoverished communities. There's seven municipalities um, with 38 tribal authorities. Now, not only the communities around the park um, 
put pressure on the pork, but we've also got the, um, one of our provinces down here in Pumalanga, and then the second province up here, El Popo. These are two biggest um, expanding provinces. So there's more people, so there's even a bigger um, pressure on the pork. And there's also quite a lot of mining activities. And all our rivers actually originate from outside the park, flowing into the park. So it's mainly um, pollution that is entering the park from these communities and from this development all around the park. So it's putting a lot of pressure on this pristine little island um, on the boundary of, of the country. So if you go into Green National Park, you've got this very natural area and that is there for the tourists. Uh, we've got quite a lot of different accommodation types to attract a, different, um, a lot of different um, tourists, but we've also got some activities. Um, it's mainly self-drive, where you just drive around and you can um, watch the animals. There's a few guided game drives, there's guided game walks, guided 4x4 trails, and guided mountain biking, but it's all guided. You're not allowed to do it on your own. So that's possibly an area that you can expand and have different activities to actually um, allow us to generate more income. So I'm not going to go into detail um, we have all these objectives, but I wanted to tell you how we design our management plans. We've got um, this adaptive management approach where we send invitations to all our stakeholders and surrounding communities and ask them to come together for a two-day workshop where we sit together and we discuss the system, um, what's the vital attributes of the park, what it means to them, and also what they want from the park. And then together we design um, a mission statement. And then from this mission statement, there's this different high-level objectives. Now for Kruger, um, the, the bio-level objectives is our biodiversity and ecosystem object objective, and that's basically our most important objective in terms of conservation. But there's also this integrating objective, which is basically your social ecological systems, and the people objective, and then lastly, the enabling objective. Now, this of the enabling objective is there because these other three objectives are many times there, and the aims are quite conflicting. Um, so this enabling objective shows us to help us to balance this conflict between the different objectives. So I'm only going to go into the biodiversity objective. And um, in Kruger, we, there's these five main themes that we want to do, um, that we are involved in our research. And the first of one is our atmospheric effects. And it's basically just to understand the climate and gather the data. Um, there's water in the landscape, which is our systems or our river systems. Um, the terrestrial ecosystem, all the animals, the interactions with the larger, bigger ecosystem activities, um, alien impact, and then also our threatened biota. So this is the main themes where our scientists are able to focus. Um, it doesn't include everything. We also make use of outside scientists to assist us. But because we're such a small group, this is only the main themes that we can get to. Oh, sorry. So um, just to, to summarize that, um, our, our sandbox scientists, our main research thrust offers the response to poor river flow and then artificial provisioning, so water provisioning. So these are the um, on the ground issues that our scientists in sandbox are struggling with at the moment. And the second one is our critical species conservation issues. And thirdly, a critical assessment of the role of elephant herbivory, along with other ecosystem drivers. And we actually have a separate elephant management plan, and it's just because elephants have such a large impact on that area in the fence park. And then last, lastly, um, it's our area integrity protection. That includes, um, we've got a research uh, a scientist working only on invasive species, our whole anti-poaching unit, um, and then also, as we were saying, is increased pressure from outside the park. And then, only since last year, we realized that you can't have biodiversity separate from tourism. You can't have a biodiversity management plan. You can't have a tourism management plan. They need to talk to each other. And in the past, it was all separate. 
Um, Duane has been appointed last year on a short-term basis to help us actually establish, this, to make this link between um, biodiversity conservation, but you also need, you need the tourist, and how to do that in a sustainable way. So, um, so as I was saying, in the past, we, um, we're now finding this link between biodiversity conservation and tourism. And we want to make sure that there's communication between your scientists, but then also between your managers on the ground, and then you've got your higher level managers from the head office. So it's these three different groups. And in the past, it was all these gaps in, in between. But now we are trying to make communication and sit together and discuss how we can have sustainable tourism without not damaging our environment. So I'm going to end off with a slide. Um, it's basically in conclusion, but to show you like the broad themes that we are at the moment discussing um, from a scientific side, um, these themes are all influenced by a global um, changes in the environment, but the managers sitting on the ground, what they are struggling with, and then the guys higher up in our head office, which needs to, to help this organization to be sustainable as well. So the main issues that times and again come up, and which is still, um, it, there's no solutions at the moment, but we are busy talking about this. Um, first of all, it's bush encroachment. With global changes, the bush is getting thicker. Tourists can't see very deep, so they can't see the animals. So you don't have a very good tourism product. And the managers on the ground, what did they do? They need these tourists. So in one talk, we actually had people that just went in a clear big area just to make it more visible for tourists. And the scientists were nearly having a heart attack because there was this gap. But I mean, this is, this is one of the issues we're struggling with, and not only in Kruger. Um, alien and invasive species are increasing. They are moving into our parks. They are getting more and more prevalent. So, um, yeah, we, we actually, we have some programs from government funded programs um, that help with people coming in and clearing um, alien and invasive species, but it's a very, real problem we have. Um, disease is another problem that's, that's been um, discussed and it's mainly because, um, well mainly it's from tick-borne diseases where the habitat has been changing. So these ticks have been spreading and they can actually now move into our box. So, so the, the prevalence and the, the areas where disease previously were present is actually now expanding as well. Um, we are losing species that needs very specific habitats. Um, a good example is our rare and endangered herbivore, um, the sable and our uh, tetsubi in Kruger National Park. I mean, the numbers are so low, but it's, we don't know why, but we assume it must be the changing in environment or the specific needs that they had in the environment. And then another um, really difficult um, issue is, um, Global climate change is, has been changing. So we have a, a fire regime and a fire management plan. But with the changes, I mean, our fire management plan can't stay as it is. It also needs to change. But how, and we don't know. Um, but fire has a big influence on vegetation in the Savannah Park, and that has a big influence on our herbivores. So these are all, all closely linked to changes in the environment. It's changes um, where tourists also don't um, or not happy with what they see. And then very recently, again, we have, we have quite a lot of increase in floods in the park. Beginning of this year, again, we had quite a lot of floods and um, roads are washed away, bridges are washed away, some of the camps are washed away. It's quite a big financial loss and it's all to do with changes, global changes. And then as Duan was saying, there's all these pressures from outside the park. The park is an island in the middle it's not only your communities, but there's mining, there's a growing population. Um, and yeah, so these, these are just the issues that we are at the moment um, with our managers on the ground sitting and discussing of how to move forward um, in this changing world. Thank you. <laughs>